And again, thank you to Dynetics for being our sponsor for today. Now the, uh, the last panel for the day is titled 20 Continuous Years of Humans in Orbit, the GRC story. And when we started putting this thing together, um, a, a few of us are really surprised at the amount of involvement that people at Glenn had in research and development of the ISS. And uh, not just the hardware systems themselves, but also in the research that's done on the ISS. So we decided to pull together a panel and have a few of the people who have been notable in those efforts over the past 20 years or so come in and talk to us. And that the panel is moderated by uh, Joel Kearns. Joel is the current Director of Facilities Test and Manufacturing at uh, NASA Glenn. But as he comes and talks to you, you're going to find out that he's had a much more varied background than just that. So Joel, take it away, please. Hey, thank you. And welcome, everybody, to the last uh, session of this year's symposium. I'm Joel Kearns. My background is I'm a material scientist. And earlier in my career, I had the pleasure of being the program manager for microgravity at research at NASA during the era of uh, space shuttle missions, suborbital rockets, the Mir Space Station, and getting ready to do work on the International Space Station. Um, much of that work that I got ready for the International Space Station and actually got flown on shuttle decades ago was actually done by the Glenn Research Center uh, in Cleveland. Um, in this session, we're gonna focus on research work that's been done on ISS that's been led, coordinated, or enabled by folks at the Glenn Research Center. And so I'm the panel moderator. I'm gonna start off and give you a little bit of background and context, but I wanna introduce you to my panel members to start. We have uh, Dr. David Urban, who's the chief for the low gravity exploration technology branch in the propulsion division of our research and uh, engineering director at Glenn. He's guided research policy for physical sciences research on areas assigned to Glenn uh, for microgravity for many years. Uh, and he's been a principal investigator and a co-investigator on research investigations, primarily in combustion science. And he's focused on soot and flame structure and flammability studies. Uh, we also have Professor uh, Mark Weislogel, who's a professor of thermal and fluid sciences at Portland State University at Oregon. Uh, he's a former um, Glenn person who for now for many years has been first out in industry and then out of the university. And he's been a principal investigator on several flight experiments on the ISS in the area of uh, fluid physics and transport. Um, he's focused a lot on surface science and, area, and subjects like capillarity. He's going to talk to us today. Uh, we also have Dr. Dan Dietrich of uh, Glenn Research Center in uh, Dave Urban's, uh, David Urban's branch, who's been a project scientist and an investigator and a co-investigator on many uh, major microgravity combustion investigations, such as the flame extinguishment or flex investigations and the cool flames investigation that's flown um, recently on the International Space Station. We also have Dr. Ryan Reeves a material scientist for the International Space Station U.S. National Laboratory, uh, administered by the non-governmental organization CASIS for uh, the United States. And he supports physical science research projects conducted on the ISS, and he uh, leads the development of the ISS National Lab Advanced Materials and Manufacturing Program today. So we're going to focus this panel on um, primarily research operations at ISS, and each panel member is going to present some key findings and work that they've done in the field, and then the panel is going to answer questions. So as moderator, I'm going to use just a few slides to provide you a little bit of history and background, and maybe some context to what the panel members are going to discuss today. If you have the first slide up with the cover, uh, you can see a nice photograph of the ISS, which is usually noteworthy to people for the large solar arrays that are on either side of the vehicle. And to remember that to operate for the past 20 years, ISS has had to have a reliable amount of quite a bit of power. Um, and that has to come from the sun. It's generated by the solar cells that are on those arrays. Um, but the system itself that Glenn Research Center had to mature and develop and enable so that NASA's contractors could build the ISS is a lot more than just the solar arrays. In the original Space Station Freedom Program, a Glenn Research Center ran one of the four major work packages of hardware being developed to put together for the station. It was the power system. And later, uh, once the station was redesigned and Boeing was made the um, prime contractor for the International Space Station, these same groups at Glenn took a leading role to develop the power systems, mature its technology, and guide um, 
Boeing as a prime contractor and actually doing engineering development of these systems, which flew successfully for what's called the U.S. operations segment of the ISS. And that not only started back, uh, you know, started in the mid 80s, continuing into the restructure in the mid 1990s, but continues today with what you see uh, in the news with the um, older um, uh, nickel hydrogen batteries being replaced by state of the art um, lithium ion batteries just in spacewalks this past week. So I want you to remember, uh, as I'm going to talk uh, for a few minutes about um, Glenn Research Center's um, role in making sure the ISS is powered so it can do research. I also want you to remember one of John Glenn's most memorable statements on his Mercury Atmos mission, which was, I'm in zero G and I feel fine. And I think the people at Glenn and the people who have worked with them at universities and industry have made a big uh, effort and a, a lot of success the last decades in making sure that zero G feels fine as a place to do science and applications work uh, for the United States. So going to slide two, which is titled Space Station Power Distribution Grid, you can see a block diagram that there's a lot more developed than just solar wings. The wings have to rotate to track the sun. The power is intermittent. You get solar, you get sunlight when you're on the sun facing side, but you're, when you're shielded in the eclipse of the earth, you have to live off of the stored power that you put into batteries. You have all these different DC voltages that you have to convert between to run different things in the ISS. You have to manage the power. You have to make sure the power quality is good. There's eight separate power channels or buses on the ISS and eight solar array, array wings, 24 sets of batteries, and the ISS had to be built to be both manually controlled by the crew in the ground, but also have some autonomous functions like battery charge and discharge or things that are hybrids like load shedding or fault isolation. Uh, so all of these had to be laid out originally by the work package for a crew, then translated into development and then translated further into the prime contract for ISS. If you could go to slide three, you'll see um, the space station power distribution system. You can see photographs of some of the early developments that were done for all these different subsystems, boxes, electrical system assemblies, et cetera. All of these that required both technology development and maturation and eventually engineering development of the actual flight hardware and software by Boeing and their selected subcontractors. And people at Glenn Research Center in our power division were very, very closely um, coupled into that, helping to guide it, helping to settle um, technical issues, helping to make sure that the system could actually get developed and would operate reliably when it got to space. If you go to slide four, I have a couple of photos here of some of the ISS power elements that started getting shipped up to orbit. I think probably starting in um, early 2000. At top, you can see one of the finished PV module integrated truss segments being prepared for launch. Uh, I want to contrast that to the photo at the lower left where you can see the development testing of uh, deployable solar array wing concepts. And the person in the photo is Glenn's Brian Smith, who's currently the director of the Space Flight Systems Directorate when he was off figuring out concepts for solar arrays, working in power engineering. On the lower right, you can see a photo of the July 1st EVA that the current expedition crew was doing to swap the new lithium ion batteries and for the older um, nickel uh, hydrogen batteries. But now I want to turn to microgravity research, physical sciences research operation on the ISS. If you go to slide five, I'm going to talk a bit about the very first microgravity physics spaceflight experiment. Um, it was recognized early that, that when you were in orbit around the Earth, you would be free falling and it would be a very unusual state, which people started to refer to as weightlessness or, or zero gravity. It's not really zero gravity, but you're falling continuously around the Earth, so everything's falling with you. So everything just kind of floats next to everything else, you know. In effect, effectively, the body force that, that we feel on Earth when we're standing as fighting against gravity is, is missing. Um, this was, it was known very early that this might be a very unusual environment for equipment to operate in. So, in 1962, Glenn Research Center investigators uh, flew one of the, the very first experiment on um, one of the original Mercury missions to study the behavior of fluids under these free fall conditions because they were looking for information on how to do fluids management of the fluid that would either be in cryogenic upper stages or satellite propulsion systems. They had to try to figure out how to manage and move the fluid around. And they discovered some very interesting things. Uh, in addition to this Mercury Atlas flight, um, aircraft were then first used in that era to fly parabolic arcs to give some, say, 10 or 20 seconds of um, low, low body force uh, freefall. Eventually, a 5.1 second drop uh, uh, tube was um, built at the Glenn Research Center campus so you could get many, many drops at about five seconds duration to tease out some of the physics and engineering 
of this phenomena. And then uh, later, a 2.2 second drop tower was built again uh, in the Cleveland campus at Lewis Field. These facilities are operating still today so that researchers around the world can develop their concepts, fine tune their experiments and hardware before they make the big jump to actually do work up on the International Space Station. Going to slide six, um, by the 1970s, uh, researchers in the US were using Apollo Skylab and later the space shuttle to study scientific questions in low gravity in five broad fields shown here. A Glenn Research Center specialized and led two of those areas for the United States and still does today, combustion science and fluid physics and transport. They also developed a very, several very important experiments in material science, one of which I'll talk about uh, in the next slide. Uh, but looking at these five different fields, I want to point out that Glenn also developed equipment that was the first to measure and characterize the actual accelerations that were still present during free fall so that people could um, rigorously understand the results of their experiments and was the first to develop uh, relatively small and quickly developed experiments, demonstrations that could be carried out in an enclosed glove box by astronauts. And that work continues today on the International Space Station. Going to slide seven, highlighting world-class science. I wanna highlight one particular material science experiment because I'm a material scientist. Uh, and this, which, uh, this experiment that was conducted in the 1990s developed by Glenn Research Center for a university principal investigator definitively tested the major theory for how solidified microstructures form due to temperature under coolings during industrial casting. This is a type of experiment that was world-class. It was recognized that by panels, including those headed by Nobel laureates. And it literally went out and helped rewrite some textbooks on some of the phenomena coming out of the 1990s. One thing I remember about this, besides it being a great experiment, was that folks at Glenn Research Center worked diligently with the university principal investigator to convert the broad science goals that were originally defined into really objective instrument requirements, uh, measurement requirements, experiment requirements, and then turn those into specifications and designed and built the actual flight instrument, the payload that flew on the space shuttle. This was a custom designed instrument for a very specific type of investigation and its success led to a lot of discussions about the relative quality and cost of using general purpose lab equipment in space versus custom designed instruments. Uh, the project manager at Glenn was a metallurgist named Ed Winza who went on to develop and lead the, the uh, early areas of developing the combustion integrated rack and the fluids integrated rack. His deputy, Diane Malarik, who later became project manager on the last two flights of IDGE, uh, is now today the deputy director of space and life and physical sciences and applications up at NASA headquarters. And a lot of the work that they did in IDGE would not only inform later work in material science and ISS, but helped um, define the boundaries of what should be common and unique equipment in combustion and fluid physics and transport work. Going to the um, next slide, to slide eight, I also want to point out that IDGE set a new paradigm for doing teleoperations or remote operations. Up until that era, pretty well everyone had to go to the Mission Control Center at JSC or the Payload Operations Center at Marshall to participate in experiment operations. But for IDGE, those uh, operations were added further out to Glenn Research Center in Ohio for a telescience support center that's used still today for ISS research but actually linked all the way out to the PI's home site in Troy, New York. That sent a new way and it was a dry run of how we would do things in the future on the ISS. So finishing up this introduction with slide nine, back in 1988, the research facilities for the space station were just being planned. At the top left, I just wanna show you a throwback slide to what the definition was of the eight major research facilities that we thought were gonna be on the space station. Uh, some have gone, come and gone. Some have actually turned out to be uh, provided by international partners and not the United States. But at the bottom of the top left, you will see on the left-hand side a little block that shows a combustion facility and a fluid physics rack facility. Um, those are up there now on station flying, producing results today, developed by people uh, and its partners from Glenn Research Center. Again, there was a great deal of discussion then about what the level of equipment should be that which should be in general in nature and facility class versus what equipment might end up being custom to each experimenter or class of experiment. And Glenn was able to determine what those breakpoints should be for combustion and fluid physics to be for the equipment to be used on ISS. And I think the past 20 years of research operations in ISS has shown that that was successful, all that work that was done back in the 80s, the 90s, going into the early 2000s.
So that, that uh, completes my opening comments. And let me turn it now over to uh, Dr. David Urban. Hi, um, glad to join you. If you could, uh, I could have the first slide, please. So this just uh, shows you the history of the uh, flight experiment that uh, NASA Glenn flew on the uh, ISS space station. Uh, starting the top row was the facilities, and the first thing we flew up there was the mic uh, microgravity measurement system. And then um, you see in 2007 and 2008, the um, two circles are the uh, combustion integrated rack and the fluids integrated rack. And they've remained, all those systems have remained up there ever since. Uh, going to the two big uh, racetracks below, you see combustion science um, began initially with some smaller experiments in the 2003 time frame, But in 2007, when the uh, combustion integrated rack went up, there's a whole host of experiments that followed along. And likewise, fluid physics in particular, they can claim credit for the first uh, facility class experiment on the ISS, which flew in 2001 and two. Physics of Colloids in Space, or PCS, and it uh, flew in that time period and then came back. And then subsequently, when the um, FIR launch in the 2009 time frame, uh, you see just a host of experiments filling in after that. And a uh, large number of those are the um, uh, complex fluids experiments I'll be talking about shortly, and a, another big number of fluid physics uh, experiments, including ones done by Mark Weislogel. So I'm going to focus on the um, complex fluids work and on the spacecraft fire safety work. Dan is gonna be talking about the um, fundamental combustion work. So complex fluids um, really refers to uh, colloids or the uh, study of the um, suspended microscopic particles or droplets that are immiscible in their surrounding, surrounding fluids. And these uh, occur in many forms on earth, you know, ranging from mayonnaise, chocolate, uh, cellular cytoplasm, uh, lots of cleaning products, and some liquid crystals, and even now the next generation of large surface area supercapacitor battery electrodes, which are often made of colloidal bigels. And the better understanding of these systems offers the opportunity to develop uh, improved drug, de drug delivery, self-assembling microsystems, and improved commercial products. And doing it microscopically enables the uh, investigators to directly observe what's happening at the colloidal particle level, typically a hundredth of a human hair in diameter. And you can then observe what's happening in individual particles and compare that to the macroscopic effect of what happened to the, uh, your mayonnaise or your, uh, your uh, liquid crystal display. And so, um, as I said, we launched the uh, Physics of Colloids in Space in 2001, did some awesome work with that, then uh, launched the Fluids Integrated Rack, or the FUR, in 2009. And there you see the crew member there in front of the FUR with a, like uh, the microscope tipped around so we uh, work on it. And we've, uh, ever since, we've been just making tremendous use of that facility, doing all kinds of uh, tests with that. Next slide, please. And now these show two uh, examples of colloidal systems. Uh, the one on the left is a, a slice of a, a gel uh, done in collaboration with Procter and Gamble. And the, this was done with that, um, uh, the confocal microscope in the uh, LMM, which now allows you to basically look through slices of the colloidal system and reconstruct the structure. And on the right is actually another facility. We're looking at uh, liquid crystal islands. And the way, as you watch the video, they'll coalesce. And that's uh, the way those uh, little uh, islands of liquid crystals coalesce uh, controls the uh, function of the liquid crystal device. And so studying of these systems in low gravity is particularly helpful because the gravitational sedimentation, the particles only really sink here on Earth, uh, and the mixture will jam, or the particles will, um, uh, aren't able to fully uh, mix the way they normally would. Um, our, those are both virtually eliminated and enabling uh, development of large 3D structures. And this has allowed Procter & Gamble to improve some of their product stabilizers and extending shelf life and allowing them to uh, have much more concentrated systems for um, to reduce transport costs. And um, the uh, this low gravity testing also allows you to make uh, colloidal particles uh, control whether they crystallize um, or stay disordered in glassy, uh, which is harder to control here on Earth. So this is, again, important not only from a fundamental science standpoint, it provides new opportunities to understand these interactions of these particles, but it also you know, helps us understand the, how order arises out of disorder in these systems and um, also has the opportunity for producing medicines in space for on-demand need for future crews. So I've only really touched on a few of the dozens of different experiments that, we've, um, uh, that are probing the behavior of these colloidal systems, but it's really been a tremendous workhorse. We've gotten a large amount of work through that system. Next slide, please. So 
in the area of spacecraft fire safety, it's, um, it's considered a credible risk and uh, you can't eliminate by designing a spacecraft. And uh, really most of our spacecraft designs for space fi fire safety were based on terrestrial experience, which turns out to be pretty misleading in the spacecraft conditions. You basically, as you can imagine, you can't escape. You only have a limited resources there. And uh, so it makes response to the fire particularly challenging. And um, our earliest experiments uh, address fire-related issues, um, both even before the SIR got up there, the, um, the earliest experiment in combustion was uh, an aerosol measurement related to fire uh, smoke detection. And, and that was in 2006 and seven. But since then, the Combustion Integrated Rack uh, was launched and that uh, the initial tests there were directed towards uh, fire safety and then subsequently moved to fundamental combustion. Now we're cycling back and doing more fire safety testing. Uh, next slide, please. So the integrated effect of a fire in a spacecraft is essentially been largely unknown. And in the SIR and in the other facilities, we've been able to study things in the order of the index card fire. You know, it's not really not a very threatening experience and not realistic. And so, um, and so we, in the, fortunately, we've only had very limited occurrences of real fires in spacecraft, and that was specifically on the Mir space station. Um, so until, Recently, unlike the Earth, where we have full-scale fire tests for every kind of occupied terrestrial structure, planes, trains, ships, automobiles, we haven't been able to do that in spacecraft because there have been too many people in the spacecraft. So, but uh, we've taken advantage of the ISS cargo supply. So this has not really been on, done on the ISS, but it's part of the ISS system. They have robotic vehicles that go up to supply the station. And so the lower left, you see an experiment being loaded into one of those vehicles. And it goes up the space station and sits uh, idle until it uh, unbursts the space station on before it returns to Earth. We do our experiments. The frame on the right was a large piece of uh, plexiglass burning in low gravity. And so and the results have shown that although the fire holds a significant risk, uh, with proper management, many fire incidents would be survivable if we continue to design appropriately. The next. Okay, thank you, Dave. Next, we're going to go uh, to Professor um, Mark Weisslogel at um, Portland State. If you'd bring up the first slide for me, too. Am I coming in okay to you? Well, okay, okay, so, okay, so uh, I'm tr I opted to tell a little bit of a story about fluid physics, uh, but in order to talk about the last 20 years, I got to start 60 years ago. This uh, Sputnik went around the Earth. And um, uh, engineers at NASA Glenn Research Center considered what's happening to the fuel in the tanks. This is what I recall from conversations with Bob Siegel, is who you see here, who in, invented the first drop tower there at that at the Lewis Field um, to study uh, fluid mechanics aboard um, spacecraft. So that drop tower, next slide, please. That drop tower spawned, that's where it started. Go ahead and click through this, um, this slide. Yeah, stop, spawned a two-second tower, click again. Yeah, a five-second tower, keep going. Uh, a drop tube into Huntsville and then drop towers around the world and even drop towers, there you go, and even drop towers for uh, educational purposes. I think, believe it or not, I think within the first 10 years of the first drop tower innovated at Glenn, there was 20 or so operating in the U.S. alone. So they've really produced a, a ton of stuff. Next slide. Here's a repeat of Siegel's first experiment ever done. Go ahead and click the video there. When gravity is taken away, um, surface tension wetting forces take off. Can you hit the, this, this is a video. Can you click on the file? Hmm, just wand over it and click, should work, no? Hey, you're spared. What takes place, oh really? It, okay, this should be a movie, but what takes place is when you get rid of gravity, there's nothing resisting surface tension driven forces and the liquid will rise to an infinite height if gravity is truly zero. So now that, that what that did was it sent everybody else dreaming about how no pumps, you know, no energy, no power, no noise, no nothing. Surface tension is going to do it all for us in space. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here's the first demonstration of a space experiment actually in space. This is the, and Joel covered this, which is a delight to me. Behind his head, go ahead and click this video once, just one click. Behind the head is that experiment that Joel introduced. So you can see that behind there was another Glenn experiment. 
and it was a, a simulation of a fuel tank and it showed that you can make a bottom in the tank if you use clever geometry. So the liquid could be located where it needs to be exited in order to, to rock it around. Okay, so that was the first experiment. Okay, um, uh, next slide. The thing is, okay, so that was the result from, okay, that little in inlet, uh, oh, hey, there's some of the people that worked on it. Uh, do you know any, recognize any of these people? You only get two seconds and your time is gone. Next slide. Okay, so that was the result. And now that's a drop tower rendition of a scaled model, which was exactly what they found in space. Nope, okay, okay, oh, that's okay, leave it there. Um, the, the one in the red box, though, is the prediction that with current tools. So though back then they didn't have those tools available to them, nor did they have the right boundary conditions and things like that to get that. We do now. Those folks, though, didn't know that there were many other things that could have happened. Now we see that there's at least seven interfaces that can form in there. Most of them are asymmetric and could lead to disaster depending on your orbital maneuver. So back then we were looking forward to doing everything with surface tension, but it just, it was a lot, um, a lot more challenging than we thought. Next slide, please. So shuttle era, click, next slide. Okay, so the shuttle era, if you remember, the astronauts hustled like crazy, they never slept, everybody worked all the time, everything was choreographed and measured, no one could make a mistake, and if you did, you had to move to the next step because you couldn't think straight. That was the shuttle, but a lot was done there. Next slide, please. During that time, we encountered results like this. Here's a simple experiment. Go ahead and click once on the image, or just click ahead. There's an interface, but it also goes there. Click one more time. It also goes there. The astronaut is just touching the device. Click again. It also goes there. Click again. It also goes there. So what, we're, what we learned during these times was that, oops, you could be very surprised when you make a very simple container like this that there are multiple metastable surfaces that are possible for forming and things like this, which means that things may not work out right. And during the shuttle era, there were some pretty significant kind of high profile failures of system due to capillary. And then the confidence in capillary and fluid physics and low gravity for multi-phase phenomena went down. Don't do it. If you can't test it on Earth, don't do it in space. Okay, next slide. Next slide, let's click through this whole slide. I won't discuss this. So click, go ahead and one more, next slide. Okay, space shuttle, space station, huge change. Space station is different, it's a more chill environment. You can pursue new discoveries, you can fix problems, you can innovate clever, clever, um, clever workarounds on the fly. All of a sudden, chance of success went from something like less than one to one and better because you could get extra science and, it, and uh, it really started producing. Click, next slide. NASA, even though fluid physics, multi-phase phenomena, bubbles and droplets and stuff, which were the challenges in fluid physics, which had been identified by NASA Glenn in the 70s and 60s, oh, I just lost my train of thought, uh, was, um, even though that they had found that, they found that they weren't gonna do capillary, okay? But anyway, NASA never stopped doing the research. They never stopped. So progress continued to be made through, through astronaut involvement with some of these experiments. And I'm sorry I'm talking about mine, but I know that there's, uh, there's plenty of others and I'm aware, aware of those too. I just threw in slides, okay? So next slide. So you have to avoid, avoid this one. It's got a bunch of videos in it, and I, I don't think I have time to talk about them, um, but bunches of experiments were done. 20 experiments, handheld devices, different geometries, different wetting conditions, each one illuminating new phenomena that is of high value. It was of interest for the science community at the beginning, but then it pulled in a lot of these, um, a lot of applications, potential. Next slide, you'll have to poke through this one. It's got a bunch of, those are all videos, so let's not watch those, okay? Then many astronauts entered in, 50 or more. So many experiments had been done. 20 years of space station has now been producing. And so it started off at fundamental physics, which outlined the fact that, whoops, this is complicated, better not use it for engineering, kept going and produced research products that all of a sudden are tantalizingly available to engineering design. Next, next uh, slide, please. 
Okay, and I'm, I'm sorry I want to do this, but I, I just wrote these and I want to say every one of them because I think it shows how, this, how the space station had really nailed it when it comes to fluid physics. So the progress over the 20 years is over 100 crew ops, over 100 days, over, a, no, hundreds of days of robotic ops. Ten, over 10,000 drop tower tests, over 100 low G aircraft prevalent. That's piling up the research, okay? In terms of the focus of these research activities for people doing fluid physics, and these are especially the live support people, but they're also the propellant management and fuel depots folks for the future. We're talking about interface configurations, interface stability, passive fluid migration. Does anybody care? Okay, I don't know who's listening, but this is like bubbles and drops. Two-phase flow with heat transfer, fluid and flows and packed beds, unique fluid properties like we heard from Dave, complex fluids. And the neat thing is a lot of the nerdy folks from the, from the 90s, from early on, you know, 90s, and now they're still going on too, but especially in the 90s, they, they provided mathematical underpinnings from a lot of this work. And so now engineering demonstrations can, can proceed in a cool way. One click, please. Next slide. Okay, so, so here's just a recovery of what we've learned. Sorry about the time, give me, give me two minutes here. Um, from the fundamentals of it, this is the, the true geek stuff. So see the literature about that. There's some beautiful, profound results that were found. This is experiment theory and numerics. But towards applications, we learned, I mean, if you're gonna do water with, handle water in space, it's like, forget it. It's a terrible capillary fluid. It's got contaminants and stuff, but now we have good data on the effects of contamination, surface roughness, surfactants, coatings, unfavorable wetting, which completely disqualifies capillary normally, but not anymore. Variable wetting, non-wetting, super hydrophobic, all these things are being tried. Bubble separations, um, uh, passive thermal forest uh, flows, a whole variety of flows. Bubble generation, bubbles are a nightmare. Bubbles shut down the primary oxygen supply system on the space station if they get in the wrong place. They're produced by thermal, they're produced by chemical, biological, fittings, a stupid fitting, a conduit, a valve will produce a bubble. And so those things, work has gone on there and now we know stuff about it. Entrainment, ingestion, outgassing, degassing, all these things. And so uh, it's pretty cool. And so also for safe uh, fluidics operations in the open cabin of the space station, you know, designs for stability and natural frequency, time constant, envelope, delta B, flow rate, there's a lot of tools in hand, and especially the impacts of geometry, which is an infinite design space to engineers. It's pretty nice to have fundamentals in hand enough to be able to give you a, a pretty good design that'll get you in the ballpark your first try uh, when you're developing a new system. And that last red thing I say is, uh, is something that I, I don't think could be said before the space station era is that a new challenge used to be faced with a research effort. But these days, uh, um, you can you can you can uh, shortcut that process because with the knowledge that we have to really get a, a research result quickly. Next slide. Is there one more? I think there's one more. Okay, last last one, and I won't go down this list, but I, I just think this list is uh, powerful. Um, the what has been learned for the in multi-phase flow and capillary stuff in in space, especially in this twenty years of the space station now, has extreme cross-cutting impacts. And so this is, this is a list, I, I, believe, I think this list is about a third of the real one, but these are all real systems that are going on that are fluids based that the system has, that the, the fundamental research has delivered design solutions for. And let me read them just because it's impressive. It's like wet lab activities, you know, omics in space, lab on chip stuff that's going on, urine processing, brine drying, plant watering systems, universal uh, liquid acquisition devices for, propellants and fuels, bubble and drop generations and separators, CO2 scrubbing, you know, uh, water storage systems, I can't read them. Okay, few, uh, condensing heat exchangers, animal habitats, you know, and so, so it's really made an impact. And uh, I'd like to stop there, but I'd, I'd like also to put this together sometime and present this to Glenn because uh, it's, it's uh, such a significant um, demonstration of how fundamentals have gone into, uh, have gone into application. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Let's go to Dan Dietrich to talk about combustion science.
Dan, are you okay, there? Okay, can everybody hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, can we go to my background slide? So it's the second of my slides. And I'm not able to see the slides, so I just have the, the slides that I have pulled up on my uh, uh, another monitor. So I, I, I like to, you know, David uh, did a nice job of pointing out the spacecraft fire safety aspect of why we do combustion science research on the ISS. I'm going to talk about the other aspect of our work, and that is fundamental combustion science. And I, I, I really like this quote from Mickey King, who was the combustion science program manager for many years at NASA headquarters, that uh, the effects of buoyancy are so ubiquitous that we, we don't really understand the enormous negative impact they've had on the rational development of combustion science. And I think uh, at the end of my talk, I, I hope that I convince you, especially with my last slide, that that's true. And you know, the, the, there is a obviously a practical reason for studying combustion, and that is that the, it is the dominant, predominant energy source in the world. And when you think about combustion, you think about the tremendous exothermic heat release and tremendous temperature gradients. And it's those temperature gradients and that heat release that allow us to move our cars and, and uh, fly planes but uh, it also creates an enormous uh, buoyancy-induced flow. And so that when you try to study combustion phenomena in a, in a 1G laboratory, uh, by definition, you're going to be, by, in, just in the process of studying combustion, you're going to be inducing these large buoyancy-induced flows. And I think the uh, sort of classical images of the candle flame that is so familiar to us all uh, show how the significant impact of buoyancy on flames. And on the left-hand side, you can see the candle flame, and near the tip of the candle flame, the buoyancy-induced velocity is on the order of a meter a second. When you go into microgravity, that buoyancy-induced flow goes away. You get this very dim, very uh, spherical flame that is powered solely by diffusion to get oxygen to the flame and uh, carbon dioxide and water vapor away from the flame. And those diffusion velocities are on the order of about a centimeter a second, so two orders of magnitude lower. Um, and when you look at, so we use for combustion science uh, facilities like the ISS as a, as a, a laboratory. And um, you know, in this case, the specialization of that laboratory is that we can study things in the absence of this buoyancy-induced flow. And if you go to virtually any textbook in combustion, you'll see that almost every theory and every numerical model that's done neglects the influence of buoyancy. But yet when you try to compare those theories and models to experiments, you're doing them in a laboratory where buoyancy-induced flows are always present. So the real promise of doing uh, combustion research in microgravity is that we can realize these textbook cases of combustion. Uh, and you know, one of the big things that that's allowed us recently is to focus on the complex chemical kinetics. And when you think about practical combustion devices and you talk about improving our efficiency, reducing pollutant formation, uh, reducing the carbon footprint or anything like that, what you're really talking about is advancing our combustion design. And in a lot of cases where you rely on precise timing of fuel and oxidizer, uh, in order to make those leaps in efficiency and uh, reductions in pollutant formation, you're talking about understanding fundamentals of combustion that right now does not exist. Uh, so that's sort of been the promise and the, the goal of the fundamental microgravity combustion research since the beginning of the program, and especially on space stations. So if we go to the next slide, which is, uh, you know, uh, the facilities that we have on the ISS, the primary facility is the combustion integrated rack. Uh, we also use the microgravity, sci uh, microgravity science glove box, which is very useful. Uh, as well, uh, but the the SIR or the combustion integrated rack is the major facility. It's a 90 liter combustion chamber, uh, and it's designed to to be in. I like to think of it as as close as you can get to doing 
lab research that you would do in your lab on Earth on the ISS. In this case, you don't have necessarily graduate students in the lab, but you do have astronauts on orbit that are doing the work. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the things. So uh, it's, uh, you know, obviously the crew maintains the hardware. We're able to operate it remotely via the Telescience Support Center here at the, the Glenn Research Center. Uh, it's uh, pressure range zero to five atmosphere. We can change the oxygen concentration and the, the diluent gases as well. And, uh, you know, then we can have six months, a year, operations on orbit of experiment operations and uh you know hopefully uh, you know achieve the the real promise and I, I i'd like to think we have uh we also have the uh, microgravity science glove box that we can use for smaller scale experiments uh these tend to be very crew intensive uh they are limited to one atmosphere pressure and um uh, 21 percent oxygen so what are we doing on the ISS now? If we go to the next slide. Uh, we have a series of gaseous fuel experiments on the ISS. Uh, one is the uh, uh, CLD, which is coflow laminar diffusion flame experiment. And we're looking at the structure and blow off limits of gas jet diffusion flames in this case. If you, again, if you go to a textbook in combustion, there's a classic problem of a fuel jet issuing into a quiescent ambient, and here we're able to really uh, I achieve that idealized configuration to study extinction limits and better understand the chemical kinetics of uh, hydrocarbon fuel oxidation. Uh, S-Flames has a similar idea, only looking at spherical flames. In this case, the advantage of spherical flames is that now you have one dimension spatially, just a radial dimension that enters, and you can see that nice spherical flame where we can look at, uh, you can eliminate the momentum equation, and now you just have this nice one-dimensional flame and do a lot of studies on flame structure, so chemistry, all things that are, you know, extremely, uh, of extreme interest to numerical modelers. Uh, flame design, uh, again, looking at a spherical flame that's also looking at soot formation and destruction mechanisms. Uh, and then we have uh, E-field flames, where we look at studying the influence of electric fields on flames and really uh, studying their potential for use as flame control in terrestrial combustors. And finally, we have the burning rate emulator, and that's... Uh, where uh, a fire safety based experiment where we're using gaseous fuels to try and study uh, in a sort of more uh, an easier to understand fuel the flammability limits of uh, polymeric materials and i think uh, if we click on the video to the right hopefully it plays uh, you'll see that this is uh, a result from the burning rate emulator experiment, you can see this very nice spherical flame grow and eventually extinguish. Uh, and, uh, you know, in this case, by taking the detailed measurements, we're able to get information about flammability limits of uh, polymeric materials that might be used on orbit. Uh, I hope that video played. So if we go to the next slide. So what's the future experiments on the ISS? And that's, uh, we're gonna jump back into fire safety here with the solid fuel uh, investigations, the SOFI investigations, solid fuel ignition and extinction experiments, uh, where we're looking at a series of experiments designed to uh, improve our understanding uh, of material flammability and, and flame spread of, uh, you know, more practical fuel, look, from a fire safety perspective, practical fuels. We have the material ignition and suppression test where we're looking at acrylic PMMA cylinders, uh, looking at uh, materials flammability research with the Smurf experiment, uh, where we're looking at PMMA cylinders in opposed and concurrent, uh, or in flammability curve, excuse me, for uh, PMMA cylinders and then flame uh, sheets of material in opposed and concurrent geometries. Uh, the narrow channel apparatus, which is uh, being studied as a potential way to do materials flammability limits on Earth. 
while minimizing the impact of buoyancy. Uh, and uh, so studying that on station to see if that's a, a feasible test method. And then uh, the radiant residence time driven flame spread, which is again looking at flame spread over PMMA sheets. And then finally, the growth and extinction limit, where we're looking at ignition and extinction of uh, large PMMA spheres in a uh, concurrent flow. And, uh, the, and finally, if we go to the last slide, uh, really the, uh, the sort of the highlight is the promise of combustion research on the ISS. If you remember the quote from Mickey King initially uh, was that, um, it, you know, the, the negative impact that these buoyancy induced flows have had on the development of combustion science. And one of the first experiments on the ISS was the flame extinguishment experiment where we were studying ignition and uh, extinction of isolated fuel droplets. And uh, so, uh, you know, these early experiments showed the expected behavior where we ignited the fuel droplet and it burned due to excess radiative loss. But then if we play the video, uh, you'll see the two videos, you can see the ignition, you get a nice spherical flame, which is exactly what we expected. Uh, and then this flame will get dim and eventually extinguish from radiative loss. And this was the phenomena that we had hoped to study, but then something very unexpected happened. And that is, you can see the flame image on the right, is that the droplet actually continued to burn with a low temperature cool flame. And, uh, you know, this was, you know, not only not expected, but believed to be impossible. And that is that uh, hot flames don't lead to cool flames, cool flames lead to hot flames. These low temperature reactions are important, very important in internal, practical internal combustion engines. Uh, but they're very difficult to study on Earth. But the conventional belief and, and conventional wisdom told us that this was impossible. And in fact, it isn't. Uh, that, you know, the ISS experiments pretty much showed conclusively that these flames can exist. And I think it's a good example going back to, you know, Mickey King's first quote is that our understanding of cool flames was dominated by testing done in normal gravity and by doing experiments in microgravity, we really, uh, you know, showed something that had been obscured really by, in, in some ways, by the, uh, you know, the, the influence of buoyancy in, in some ways. And so, uh, you know, these, these uh, experiments have proved to be a real uh, insight into low temperature uh, chemistry and, uh, you know, research that is still continuing uh, in ground-based facilities now. So I think that concludes my talk. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dan. And let's um, go to Dr. Ryan Reeves from the National Lab, Ryan. Yes, um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here um, and joining this panel. Um, I'll be giving a, a very brief introduction to the um, ISS National Lab and some of the investigations that we've uh, sponsored from Cleveland and from around Ohio, and how these uh, have enabled, uh, have been enabled by the work at Glenn Research Center. Next slide, please. First, a uh, brief introduction into the ISS National Lab. Um, in 2005, Congress designated the US portion of the ISS as a national laboratory, with the goal of providing access to US-based researchers from across academia, industry, and government agencies. In 2011, our organization, the Center for Advancement of Science and Space, or CASIS, took over managing the National Lab. Our mission uh, is to focus, uh, is to provide access to the unique environment of this research facility in Lower Earth Orbit, specifically to foster scientific discovery and technological innovation, expand US leadership in commercial space, and inspire the next generation. And so we're very excited that, uh, that, that the, at the end of this year, we will have had 20 years of continuous uh, human habitation aboard the ISS in space. It's uh, very, very exciting. Uh, next slide, please. I want to touch briefly on how Glenn Research Center has provided essential contributions to a lot of the projects that we have sponsored over the years. 
Uh, in particular, their expertise in combustions, fluid physics, multi-phase systems, and thermal transport are, are areas that overlap significantly with an annual collaboration we have with the National Science Foundation. In the area of transport phenomena, we are now just completing the fifth year of solicitations of these. Between the hardware development, including the fluids and combustion facility, as well as the technical expertise of the engineers and scientists at Kleiner Research Center, um, they have provided significant contributions to the success of these projects. This, uh, this includes contributions of engineering and operational support from Glenn, as well as contractors and implementation partners like Zinn Technologies. So next I'll discuss uh, very briefly three projects that have recently flown um, from institutions across Ohio. The first one is from Case Western Reserve University and is one of these projects that has come out of the collaboration with the National Science Foundation um, and also has very close ties um, and investigators at, at Glenn. Uh, so this project is being conducted um, by a team led by um, Yating Liao at uh, Case, Reserve, uh, Case Western Reserve University looking at flame spread in confined spaces where potentially the flame spread may be uh, pose more of a serious ha uh, fire hazard than in open spaces. Specifically, conducting the experiment on the ISS in persistent microgravity environment allows investigators to begin to study the flame spread in the absence of buoyancy driven flow, allows them to decouple some of the transport phenomena involved in flame and heat spread. The image here on the left is actually from a related project that involves uh, much of the same research team, in which they were looking at flame spread over ultra thin solids using the five second drop tower at Glenn Research Center. The experiment is currently on station. Uh, much of the operations have been successfully conducted and concluded. Um, there are some remaining samples that we expect to be completed shortly. Next slide, please. The next investigation is from the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, um, from a team led by Derek Shuttleworth, investigating how they could improve the performance of tires by pushing the limits of the silica fillers within the rubber matrix. Silica is added to tires to improve some of the mechanical properties, such as traction or fuel efficiency. Um, however, understanding the network that these silica particles create or the dispersion of these particles within the rubber matrix make a significant impact on the mechanical properties that the tires would exhibit. Goodyear's experiment conducted last year uh, investigated how the silica structures form a matrix in the absence of sedimentation or convection effects in a persistent microgravity environment. The initial tests from the samples that were brought back down from uh, to Earth demonstrated that there was a change in the, ma the material response to stress. However, the tests are still ongoing. Uh, Goodyear is hopeful to learn from the potential novel silica network structure or dispersions to improve upon next generation tires. Next slide, please. The last project that I'll touch on um, is the Procter & Gamble uh, project that was uh, mentioned before by David by a team led by Matthew Lynch investigating colloidal gel stability. The goal of this investigation was to examine how to improve the shelf life of colloidal personal care products. For example, the colloidal networks that make up gels and shampoos could, should be stable enough to sit on shelves for years, uh, but should be easy enough to break by applying an external force, such as squeezing of a bottle, um, such that the product flows when you need it to. Uh, if you click one more time on the video, this is the same video that, that David showed before. Um, so Dr. Lynch and his team were studying the coarsening and formation of these networks in polydispersed colloidal gels when you remove things like buoyancy and sedimentation. This work led to the awarding of three new patents for Procter & Gamble. All right, uh, last slide, please. So I'll conclude my presentation um, and yield the floor just by saying that there's been a lot of exciting research that's been, uh, that has been and is being conducted on the ISS right now. Um, and the expertise of the Glenn Research Center has significantly contributed to the success of our mission of fostering scientific discovery and technological innovation in space and leading the U.S. leadership in commercial space. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you to all the uh, panel members. Um, I don't see any questions posed by the audience, so I just want to um, throw out uh, to the panel, if you'd like to comment, 
Um, what is your dream ISS research project? If you could do any project in the future on the ISS, what would you like to do? I'm going to go around the panel and I'll start with Dave Urban. <clears throat> dream, uh, I. Hmm. Got to go fast, though. Where is this going to okay, be? Okay, so I, I think I really want to push uh, we're in the same area where uh, in a high pressure combustion, looking at the. Uh, um, where the, uh, we need for future engines to go to higher and higher pressure conditions is really where I think the next step would be in combustion. Okay, I'm going to go to Mark. A, a fluids facility that lays down on the MWA, pumps around gases and liquids and studies droplets and bubble interactions with a variety of geometries. Well, that was pretty fast. Yeah. I'll go to Dan. It's, it, it's, okay, well, one more thing. It's controlled from the ground and you just run it for months. Uh-huh. Okay, Dan? You have your mute, mic on mute. Apologies. Uh, boy, it would be a cop out if I just said, uh, just said, yeah, uh, what, what Dave said. So I'll say I would really like a, an experiment where we just study a stable, steady cool flame, a very weak. I want to study the weakest flame that I can get, the weakest low temperature flame I can get. Okay, and Ryan, what would you want to do as a PI, or what do you think your industry partners would really want to do coming up on ISS? Well, the, the, I think the, one of the biggest focuses that we're, that we're looking at now is how can we translate some of the results, all the great results that, that, that uh, my, my co-panelists have, have talked about into in-space production. So how can we start to make things in space that we can't do here, um, whether that's for use in space or whether that's to bring back down. So there are examples of that, like the Zeebland optical fibers or, um, or Lambda Vision, um, their retinal implants. Uh, but, but we're looking for a lot more of those sorts of ideas. All right, thank you. So to, to wrap up this panel, what I want to say is I, I, I want to thank everyone for giving good overviews of the work you've done and the work done in your field, particularly in ISS the last 20 years. You can see that the, it's really been built up on a firm foundation of work that's been done around the country, but a lot of it originated at Glenn Research Center, either because the research was done at Glenn or Glenn enabled other people to get their research done or enabled international cooperations or provided unique engineering or operations capabilities that didn't exist before they were um, piloted at Glenn Research Center. Um, I wanna thank um, the uh, symposium attendees for attending the panel and um, thank um, the uh, organizers for the symposium. Um, you know, I never answered the lightning round question. Since I'm a material scientist, I have to say that uh, thinking about it, that I've always wanted to do a really large um, crystal growth experiment on the ISS of the type we talked about doing in the early 1980s when we were first talking about the NASA space station. I think it's a big opportunity to do some really unique uh, benchmark material um, generation that would be really useful to industry, but just because of the press of business and the and how things have, we've gradually learned how to use the ISS, nobody has quite bitten that off yet. I'm hoping that somebody in the future will take that big industrial level step and really demonstrate a champion material on the ISS.